This time, we're going to talk about one category of super erosion microscopy method. And this category is the ones that are based on single molecule switching, or as someone called it, single molecule localization. To understand why we can get super resolution out of a normal diffraction microscope, we need to start in from considering the basics of fluorescence microscopy. So in fluorescence microscopy, we have these, say, some structures in the cell, and then we stain with the fluorescent dyes. And because of the diffraction limit, we have some blurry image out of these uh, frozen, uh, frozen signal from the dyes. Now, we have to understand that in a cell, we never have continuous structure like this. All the structure is made of discrete molecules, and our frozen image is consists of signal from discrete flow force. And with the development of the fields for single molecule detection in the past more than 20 years, now it's fairly routine for us to capture the fluorescent signal from one molecule, given that we have a good enough microscope and a sensitive enough camera. On the other hand, even if you have just one molecule, it's still going to look blurry because of the diffraction limit. In this case, a red fluorescent molecule is going to have full width half maximum of 320 nanometer. So that doesn't seem to be able to improve our resolution. But we also know that given even a peak as broad as Mount Everest, as long as we know the profile of the peak, we can fit the profile, we can get the center position. And that we can do it very precisely. It's the same case for single molecule peaks, as long as we have only one molecule. I'm going to explain why we can do that so precisely. We know that our camera just keep detecting photons, frozen photons coming from that molecule. And then when every single photon hitting the pixel, the camera is essentially recording the position of that photon. And the error of deriving the molecule position from the photon position is exactly our points of function, or represents the diffraction limit. A single molecule image is going to be make, made up of more than one photons, and can be 10 photons, 100 photons, 1,000 photons. And this is equivalent to measuring the single molecule position 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. In the end, we know that given the error of the mean, the nucleation precision improves as the square root of number of photons. And because we can collect a lot of photons from one molecule, we can get very high nucleation precision. So that is how we can get diffraction limit resolution. But that's not everything. In a real image, we can have hundreds and thousands of molecules. In this case, there's no way we can do single molecule localization. So a very important procedure to get super resolution image to make single molecule localization a microscopic method is to have flow force that we can control whether it's in a frozen state or in a dark state. And these are flow force either as organic dyes or as frozen proteins. So what we can do, we can at the beginning put them all in a dark state, and these flow force can be turned into the frozen state by light. So we can give a very, very weak activation light. And then only a very small fraction of this flow force will get into the frozen state. Now we have a sparse subset of the single molecules. We can do our single molecule localization, get the positions. And we can then turn them off, either by off-switching or bleaching, and turn on another subfraction of these molecules. We just let this process go, and we'll start to accumulate molecule positions, and we can then use these single molecule positions to reconstruct a high-resolution image. So this method has been independently developed in three different groups, and given three different names, like STORM, PALM, and FPALM, and these are basically the same method. And now you can see even more names, but they are all following the same principle. So I've explained to you some of the basics of how we can do superficial microscopy by single molecule switching and single molecule localization. One example shown here is microtubules in a, in a mammalian cell and just immunostained by anybody using a Alexa 647 uh, which is fully switchable under a certain condition. So we do the flow switching, we do the localization, we got a stored image. 
And this is reconstructed from a total of 40,000 frames and 3.4 million nuclear action points. And from the zoomed in image, you can see the improvement of our resolution so that in the very dense region where conventional force microscopy is not showing much detail, we are still able to resolve every individual microtubules. And we can also quantify our nuclear action precision in this image by counting these scattered individual clusters, which re represents non specific bound secondary antibodies. And the uh, dispersion of this um, points gave a full width half maximum of 24 nanometer or standard division of 10 nanometer. That's more than an order of magnitude improvement over the 320 nanometer full width half maximum of the diffraction limit. So this is basically how we can get storm image. And one thing is the serial structures are all in three dimension. So we need to think about a 3D imaging method. For 2D imaging what we do is we have a floor 4 in a cell, and we image in the camera. We do the localization, we get an XY coordinate. That reconstructs a 2D image. For 3D imaging, we need to get a Z coordinate in addition to the XY. And fortunately, there are a number of single molecule nucleation, 3D nucleation methods that's already developed that we can use. One of the simplest way is just to use the shape of the single molecule spot itself. We know that when a single molecule spot is in focus, we see it nice and sharp. When it's out of focus, then it's got blurry. And then, using how blurry it is, we can tell how far away it is from the focal plane. But there's a problem. First, we cannot tell whether it's above or below the focal plane. And second, when the molecule is at the focal plane, this is the case when this method is the least sensitive. So one method of doing single molecule 3D localization is to introduce a cylindrical lens in the imaging optic path and that gets some aberrations in the image. And basically the X and the Y direction is not in focus at the same time. In this case, the Y is in focus, the X is out of focus, so you see an elliptical shaped single molecule spot that's elongated in the X direction. Depending on the Z position of this molecule, both X and the Y can be a little bit out of focus, so it's round, or X can come into focus. So then we encode the Z position in this the shape of single molecule spot. And we can still determine the XY position from the center. So here is one example. We have blinking single molecules, and we scan the stage from below the focal plane to above the focal plane. You can clearly see the shape change. And one example of 3D imaging, again, microtubule uh, network, and in this case, we not, not only have resolved every single microtubules, and now the color encodes the Z position. From this domain image, you can see that we are resolving these two layers of microtubules that's been separated by a distance of about 500 nanometer, which is not resolvable by confocal or two photon microscopy. In addition, we know that to XY, which will have 20 to 30 nanometer resolution, in the Z, we also have 50 to 60 nanometer nucleation precision. In all three dimensions, that's more than an order of magnitude improvement over conventional frozen microscopy. Besides this cinematic image method, there are many other single molecule nucleation methods that we can use. For example, you, by imaging in two different focal planes, so that either of the two focal planes is out of focus at a given Z position, or by engineering the point set function shape. For example, this work uh, done by W. Morris group has introduced a double helical point set function so that one molecule appear as a pair of points whose, or whose relative angle depends on the Z position. And the most precise Z nucleation method has been using two objectives, two opposing objectives, and using the interference of forces and light collected from these two objectives to determine the Z position, and that has a ch in, led to a Z resolution or Z nucleation precision that's even better than the XY nucleation precision. So that's how we can get 3D nucleation method, uh, 3D nuclear emission, and 3D images. One thing you understand that the key for single molecule switching based superficial microscopy method is for the squishable floor force. And that may sound something fairly intimidating, 
But in fact, a lot of fluorescent dyes and fluorescent proteins that we are using in the lab has been discovered to be photoswitchable. This includes the red and the far red cyanine dyes discovered by um, whose photoswitchable probably discovered by Shawi Drones Group and Max Sauer's lab in 2005. And um, Max Sauer and Shawi Drones has done more uh, screening to find that a lot of the common dyes spanning all the way from blue to far red and near, near infrared has the full squishable property once you have a reducing uh, environment. And another big family of full squishable fluorescent probes will be the full squishable fluorescent proteins. And, and that goes back as early as um, 97 when W. Mora discovered the EYP is full squishable. And recently there has been a lot of them coming out almost one every two months. I'm showing you one example of these photo switchable dyes. This red dye, Psi 5, or an Alexa 7 basically they share the same chrome 4 structure. These are very good dyes. That means if you're excited with red light, they're going to ex emit extremely strong fluorescence, capture single molecule images. And when there's a file in a buffer, the red light will drive a photochemical reaction between the thiol and the dye, and that will change the chemical structure of dye and make it non-fluorescent. By exciting the non-fluorescent dye, the dark duct dye, with either UV light or extremely strong red light, this will reverse the reaction and make it fluorescent again. In this case, the red light drives both off-switching and on-switching. So if you put the red light on, here you can see blinking. And because the blinking of individual molecules are independent, this kind of temporarily separates the single molecules images of different dyes. We can use even that to do subversion microscopy. For example, we can label microtubules in a cell using a commercial Alexa 637 label secondary antibody, do the flow switching and localization. Now we get our supervision image. And from the zoom image, you can also see the resolution improvement. Now we have so many dyes that we can use. This will allow us to do multicolor imaging. And that basically enables us to study the interaction of cellular structures and molecules inside a cell. And to do multicolor imaging, one of the very straightforward way would be to use two different fluorophores. Say, in this case, for example, we use a fluorescent dye, like 637, and a fluorescent protein, uh, MEOS2. And they have different excitation wavelengths and different emission wavelengths. So we can excite them at the same time using two, two lasers and separate emission. Here's some raw image. You can see the blinking of Alexa 47 as well as the blinking of the fluorescent protein MEOS2. Then we can do the location individually and align them. That is a two-color image of microtubules in the cell enabled with both fluorescent protein and secondary antibodies. And here we can uh, compare the same structure image with two different probes, which I'm, going to go, which I'm going to discuss in more detail later on, several slides later. So this is one way of doing multicolor imaging. The photo switchable red cyanine dye in particular allows us a different way of doing multicolor imaging. Let's come back to the photo switching mechanism of side 5 We know that the red laser drives the off switching, and UV as well as the red drives the on switching. Now, if Psi 5 has another 404 nearby, in this case Psi 3, we can drive the on switching by exciting Psi 3 with a green laser. Here's one example Psi 5 single molecules on the surface again, and turn on the red, they switch off, and with every flash of the green light, it turns back on. And the Psi 3, in this case, we call it an activator 404, determines another wavelength that we can use for activation. And here is another experiment, for example, we try to activate this dye pair with three different lasers, green, blue, and violet. The Psi 3, Psi 5 pair only responds to the green laser because that's where the Psi 3 observes. If we pair it with Psi 2, then it responds to the blue laser, and Alexa 4.5 Psi 5 pair 
would only respond to the valid 405 nanometer laser. That allow us to di distinguish different type pairs using the activation wavelength. In this case, we use an alternating sequence of two activation lasers for dyes that turn on just after the activation laser pulse. We can assign the color to the nucleation point to it. And that allows us to do multicolor imaging. For example, in this case, we're imaging microtubules together with Catherine Curry pits. In a conventional fluorescent image, you can see some of them are kind of overlapped in the image, but with the increased resolution, now you can see the two structures are definitely separated. So we have discussed that these two different multicolor imaging methods. One, using different emission wavelengths, one use different activation wavelengths. The advantage of using different emission wavelengths to distinguish 4-4 is that you can use simple 4-4s instead of dye pairs, and it has very little crosstalk. The activation method has crossed out because the red laser can also activate the flow force. And the other advantage is that you can just turn on a laser, collect the image continuously, whereas if you want to use different activation wavelengths, you have to have sh a shorter laser sequence. To the advantage of the activation wavelength method, well first, for different channels, you are simply imaging exactly the same 404. That simplifies the detection optics, and there's no image alignment required. For the different emission wavelength method, um, because to compensate for the chromatic abrasion, up to nanometer precision, that's not a really easy task. So we've been talking about the advantages of supersession microscopy, and well, is there any limit of what we call supersession? Here it comes back to our localization precision formula. We have our improvement over our diffraction limited resolution, and this improvement factor is roughly the square root of number of photons we can collect from the molecule. And for our red cyanine dye, basically so far the brightest one, we can collect 6,000 photons in one photo switching cycle, and that should give us about five nanometer uh, theoretical localization precision. And this is when the sci five is photo switching. If you consider all the photons that we can collect from this 404, it goes easily to 100,000. And that's less than one nanometer. So this sounds extremely impressive. But this is just our location precision. And for practice, there's a lot of limitations. One of the limitations is the size of the fluorescent probe itself. A lot of the images I showed you just now are using immunofluorescence, and the antibody, which has a size of about 10 nanometer, that is nothing in conventional fluorescent microscopy, but here, 10 nanometer is already comparable to our resolution, especially considering if we use primary and secondary antibody for indirect immunofluorescence. For example, here is the zoom in of the microtubule uh, images that I showed you just now, and if we measure the width, of microtubule is 15 to 8 nanometer instead of the known 25 nanometer width of the, of the microtubules. So the extra 33 nanometer comes from these two layers of antibodies. As a comparison, if I use fluorescent proteins, and that is a much smaller probe. And here, as I said, it's the microtubules at the same time labeled with fluorescent proteins. If we measure width this time, it's 43 nanometer. It's definitely narrower com uh, compared to the antibody, and that is because the size of the probe is much smaller. But the disadvantage for fluorescent proteins is that it gives out much fewer photons, in typically less than 1,000 photons per, square, per photo activation event. So if you look at the images, the antibody staining microtubules have a fairly sharp boundary, whether it's the fluorescent protein image is a little bit blurry because the nucleation precision is not as good as antibody staining. Overall, if we compare fluorescent protein versus the antibody for superficial microscopy, the difference is almost the same as in conventional fluorescent microscopy. Um, fluorescent protein is very useful for live sample labeling. It has very high specificity, very high labeling efficiency, and um, it, you can label it by genetic encoding. This is both to the advantage and disadvantage. 
because if you want to detect in the endogenous for uh, endogenous protein, then fluorescein protein fusion method is not the good good enough approach. And to the advantage of the antibody immunofluorescence method, it has can have very high signal that leads to very high nucleation precision, and. Uh, it also contains much more colors compared to the limited palette of photoactivated fluorescein proteins. So it's more advantageous for multicolor imaging. Here we talk about one limitation of the, of the effective resolution, the probe. There is another limitation. So here, you know, we collected our, our microtubule images for a total of 40,000 frames. If, if I'm not using the entire 40,000 frame movie to reconstruct an image, we can get, we can have fewer points. We can do it with 200 frames, 500 frames, 1,000, 5,000, always the full 40,000 movie. In this case, you can see that we, you don't really resolve all the microtubules until you have 500 frames. In the same cell where microtubules are much denser, here, you can see that you really need to go to 5,000 frames to distinguish individual microtubules. So, it's the same nucleation precision, but the capability to resolve structures is really connected to the density of molecules. And that can be simply explained by the Nyquist criterion. So suppose we have some line-like structures in the cell, and if our sampling density is not there, we really cannot say that, okay, we have two lines. And it's only when the point-to-point -point distance is comparable to one half of the feature size, or smaller than one half of the feature size. Now, we can reliably rely, uh, resolve the structure. And it is best understandable by this single molecule nucleation type of super nucleation microscopy method. But in fact, because for fluorescent microscopy, we all use discrete 4 4 neighboring. So this neighboring density limit resolution applies to all fluorescent microscopy methods. It's just, for example, for confocal microscopy, it's not always not easy to turn out to be the written, to be the limiting factor because the optical resolution wasn't there. And this density limiting resolution matters a lot if you want to do time-resolved uh, time live cell imaging because the longer the integration time is, the more points you can collect. Okay, for live cell imaging, in fact, it's not that difficult. So we know in collecting the, move, the data for superficial microscopy, we simply collect a very, very, very long movie. And if we do single molecule nucleation in the entire movie and stack them all together, we get our superficial image. If we're not doing that, instead we divide this very long movie into shorter time steps. For each time step, we can still cons cons reconstruct a superficial image, and then by playing these time steps, we, we can play our superficial movie. So here's one example, and again, uh, microtubules in live Drosophila S2 cells enabled with a full switchable fluorescent protein MELS2, and this is conventional fluorescent image. If we stack all the nucleation points together, we got our superficial image. And we can divide this into time steps. And to get a movie, in this case, each time step is um, 1,200 frames per um, and we are occurring at 60 frames per second, and this gives us 20 second time resolution. So 20 second time resolution is um, kind of able to study some of the nice cell behavior, but it's not quite sufficient. But what's limiting this time resolution? Let's do some very simple calculation. And so here's our single molecule image filled with half max bone 320 nanometer. And let's play it safe. We assume that one molecule is going to occupy this 500 by 500 nanometer in size of box. And we don't have one to the density, we don't want the density to be too high because if it's as high as this, you cannot do single molecule localization. And because the switching is completely random, we want to minimize the probability of two molecule overlap. So in practice, we can have an average 0.1 molecules switched on in this 0.25 micrometer square box in every camera frame. 
Then we can do the calculation. If we want a 70 nanometer density limit resolution, that means 35 nanometer point to point distance, that we need 2,000 frames to get enough points. And 2,000 frames, if we are acquiring at 100 frames per second, that's exactly 20 second time resolution. And if we want to do it faster, there are two ways we can do. One is increase the camera frame rate. Recently, Shelby Jones group has shown if to be able to acquire a camera image at 1,000 frames per second, and that improves the time resolution a lot. And another way is if we can develop algorithm that can still identify single molecules out of this very, very densely overlapped 404 images. And that can also improve the time resolution um, as has been shown by some of the more recent studies, including our own work. So that's about live cell imaging and the limitations of live cell imaging. There's inherent spatial temporal resolution trade-off. And I would like to end this lecture by showing some of the images that we have taken of two-color 3D imaging of mitochondria and microtubules of clathrin pit and uh, an F-bar domain protein binding the neck on the, on the underneath the pit and our imaging of synapses in mouse brain sections.